first, I would like to welcome everyone. If I haven't met you, and I'm seeing lots of new names today, so that's exciting. I'm Lois Perry. I'm chapter chair of SCORE in Orlando. And we work with our, our fellow SCORE chapters in our district. There's seven of us that work together to promote these webinars so that we get a lot of people in to help. And the attendance has, has been great on this. So I'm so glad you're taking time out, as we used to say in the restaurant business, to sharpen your saw. You always need to continue to get training and continuing education in all aspects of your life and especially your business. If you're not as familiar with SCORE, we are an offshoot of the SBA. We are the local boots on ground. We are volunteers. We all come from uh, executive roles from corporate America, or we're very successful entrepreneurs. So we can sit down one-on-one -on -one with entrepreneurs to talk about the journey and what issues they have. We're nationwide. If we don't have an expertise in Orlando, we can go out to a database and find someone who has that. We were, and the second part, in addition to mentoring, is education. And we'll do about 280 webinars uh, this calendar year. So there's something for everyone. Go to the, the website, score.org slash, and whatever your home uh, score is. Ours, of course, will be Orlando. And go to, uh, local uh, education and a calendar drops down and you can shop by, by topics. It's, it's very easy for you. Uh, but we hope you take advantage of those. We used to charge $35 a piece for these. The pandemic hit, folks said, Lois, we need this so bad, but we don't have the money for it. So we went out to our sponsors and said, what can you do to help? So basically our sponsors have prepaid your tuition. So so you can think the banks like Wells Fargo, TD Bank, Wells, South State, do you see them on all of our emails that come out? Because they have paid for you to be able to do this. So uh, administratively, I'll be in the background as, as your engineer of the day. Uh, Chris will be sending you out the, uh, uh, the presentations uh, by the end of the week. I, I think we can make it happen, can't we, Chris, between this afternoon and tomorrow? And then by early next week, we'll have the video app. You can see uh, Chris and I both put the link in a couple of times. And there's also a link on uh, Chris's website. So that's how you can get all of your assets. So with that, I'm turning off the Southern accent and giving it to you guys. I'm here if you need anything. I'll be following chat and Q&A. Have a great time. Uh, there really is no better partner than SCORE for CFITO, uh, as well as new entrepreneurs and small businesses. Uh, I'd like to also uh, extend a big thank you to all the participants here today. Uh, I'm really excited that you've made us part of your journey to start and grow your business. Uh, I'm Chris Leggett, Program Manager for the Central Florida International Trade Office here at the National Entrepreneur Center. And I also serve as the current chair of the Central North Florida District Export Council. CFITO helps connect small businesses and entrepreneurs to the opportunities in the global marketplace. We do this through one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, hosting uh, educational events uh, like this one today, uh, as well as facilitating the visit of international trade delegations to the region. Uh, I'm very excited to share to you today uh, two great experts on logistics and distribution. Uh, this really is something that's vital to small businesses. Uh, if you make a great, great product, uh, have a great sales team working with you, you've done all the marketing, uh, if you can't get that to your customer or you can't uh, get the component that's going to enable you to manufacture the product, then your whole business can fall apart. So while this is something that really uh, is in the background, it is a major expectation uh, for by your customers that you'll get it the, the product to them quickly uh, and uh, when promised. And of course, cost is going to be in there as well, which is uh, why uh, uh, reliability, uh, speed, and cost are all factors to be considering when you're looking at uh, distribution and logistics for your companies. And we're blessed to have two incredible speakers with us today. 
Uh, JP Escobar is a business development manager with H&M Global Logistics. Uh, JP is a sales professional in international sourcing, logistics, and freight forwarding, and he's always looking for the next opportunity to participate in the domestic and global marketplace. He's going to share with us today the insights that he has gleaned from over 20 years experience in international freight forwarding, air or ocean, trans-Pacific, transatlantic, South American, North American, Australia, and Indian subcontinent trade lanes. So this is really someone who, who knows the, how to move things around the world. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to learn from the experience of Diego Sampaio on getting your products to your consumer. Uh, Diego is a serial entrepreneur who started his first company when he was just 16 years old, and he sold it seven years later to one of the largest internet companies in Brazil. Uh, today, he's the founder and CEO of Global Fi, which is based in Orlando and helps foreign entrepreneurs to establish and expand their business in American and global markets, including acting as their local fulfillment center. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate, sorry, reiterate uh, what you heard uh, from Lois, the webinar will be recorded and shared on the CFITO YouTube channel. Uh, details will be sent to registrants after the event. And if you do not get a notification, please reach out to me at chris at CFITO.org. I'll also have my contact information in the chat box. Uh, and please wait around after the presentations for the debut of a special May the 4th video and an opportunity to win two free tickets to the hottest networking event in town. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pass things over to JP. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Lois. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, John Paul with H&M Global. Uh, you call me JP. And uh, let me just share a screen with you. I'm with H&M Global Logistics. I'm doing a little brief presentation on shipping and distribution, basically for, for the participants out there, um, a little bit, Shipping 101 or freight forwarding 101, just so you could get an idea of uh, what it, it might entail for you to either get your product to an international customer, or if you're importing a product or raw materials because you plan on manufacturing here in the US, what you might need to consider um, when you're importing into the US and how that might affect your landed costs uh, because of course you want to incorporate all your costs uh, into the into your, your your pricing, so you could uh, get a return on your investment on, and do the right markup on your product. Um, so the background, uh, we'll start with our background. Um, and hold on a second, Chris. Let me see if I can, there we go. Let's gotta move this. Um, so H and M Global Logistics, we're a full service freight forwarder and licensed customs broker, headquartered in Orlando, Florida. We operate a 50,000 square foot warehouse. And uh, H&M, we are a minority owned small business uh, founded in 2010. And we are a, a 3PL division of H&M Enterprises, uh, which is basically the, the name of the parent company. Uh, we do offer a holistic approach to supply chain management. Our logistics services cover all modes of domestic and international cargo transport, customs brokerage, warehousing and distribution. And our size is our competitive advantage. The fact that we're a small business, we understand what the challenges are out there for, for, for smaller businesses. We also know that we have to put our best foot forward as a small business. Uh, every customer is a VIP customer. So we, we take our size we, uh, as a competitive advantage and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't shy away from competition from the big boys uh, when we have that level of confidence. Uh, the core services that we have to offer. Uh, we do offer international air and ocean freight. Now you do, you do have the option of, of, of both routings and we can get into that later on. For domestic transportation, we offer ground transportation and expedited. Sometimes it's okay to take uh, four to five days uh, to get to your destination. Sometimes you need it overnight. Uh, we offer customs house brokerage services. Uh, that's for international on the import side of things. Uh, we offer warehousing and distribution and we also offer foreign to foreign and that's when you're shipping from one country to another country and you're not necessarily have to bring the shipment or your goods into uh, the USA. Specialized services, we offer project cargo, charter services, hand carries, pick and pack, trade show services, uh, ITAR and EAR, that's for regulated goods, uh, white glove final mile, which is something that Diego uh, uh, might touch upon in his presentation. And we also work with uh, hazardous materials. And we'll move on to our next slide. So what is a freight forwarder? 
So by definition, freight forwarders arrange the best means of transport, domestic and international, taking into account the type of goods, the customer's delivery requirements and regulations. Uh, when and where, where, where can we uh, 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 participate or, or, or take uh, part of the shipping equation? Generally, freight forwarders assume responsibility for the transportation from the place of receipt to the place of destination. So it's, it's pretty clear cut. This slide here, I'm sorry, dumped the slide. This slide here is just to give you an idea of the key trading partners of the USA. Um, these countries kind of um, jump around from top spot to second spot to third spot. There are, but they are our primary trading partners. And you'll notice Canada and Mexico are on the list. Of course, there are neighbors, there are our North American neighbors. So there are key trading partners for us. Of course, China uh, is always going to uh, make the list. And we do have Japan and UK uh, rounding out the, uh, the top five. Uh, so the basics, the presentation is going to cover your income terms. And we'll get into what they are. But those are basically guidelines and shipping terms of, of, of responsibilities and of what you need to consider. Uh, when you're going to engage in international shipping. Uh, we have modes of transport, routing, uh, transit time, U.S. customs and government requirements, uh, which is important, and any licenses or license exceptions that your product might have. And Chris, as we move around or we move forward with the presentation, if anyone has any questions, by all means, just let me know and we could, we could uh, answer any questions that uh, the participants may have. Um, regarding the INCO terms, what are INCO terms? So the INCO terms are rules um, or, or international commerce terms, commercial terms, uh, that are a series of predefined commercial terms published by the International Chamber of Commerce relating to international commercial law. The INCO term rules are intended primarily to clearly communicate the tasks, costs, and risks associated with the transportation and delivery, and delivery of goods from the seller to the buyer. Key points, INCO terms do not constitute contract or govern law. Uh, INCO terms do not define where title transfers. The INCO terms do not address the price payable, currency or credit terms, uh, nor a name, but a name point or place must be preceded after the INCO terms. So again, they're a guideline. And the reason they're a guideline is, here we go, uh, widely used INCO terms. And you'll notice here that in light blue is the seller's responsibility and with X works being a door to door service. And on the other side of the spectrum, DDP and DAP also being a door to door service. But you'll notice that the responsibility of the seller changes from one from one inco term from the other door to door where. At X works, the responsibility lays with the buyer in dark blue, whereas with INCO term DAP delivered at place, responsibility lays with the seller light blue. So those are these are INCO terms that you're going to need to consider. Uh, they're going to be part of this presentation. You can reach out to me and uh, with any questions you may have regarding INCO terms or do a um, an internet search so you, so you could get familiar with what these terms are and, and what they cover. Uh, so modes of transport, we have uh, your air freight services. We have ocean freight services uh, with the containerized cargo. You see the containers right there on top of the vessel. And we also have for ocean freight less than container load. So you may not want to pay uh, the premium for air freight. You want to uh, save yourself some money on shipping by routing it via ocean freight but you don't have enough for a full ocean container. You only have enough for a pallet. Not a problem. Uh, we can uh, work that out for you and we can use a consolidated service where you can still save money uh, via ocean freight, even though you don't have uh, a large enough order. Um, your transit times, they do vary from point to point and from carrier to carrier. Air freight service is gonna be your fastest transit time. That's where you're gonna pay a premium for shipping. Uh, direct, direct flights are available for some uh, airport pairs, but not all. And when direct flights are not available, shipments arriving into the USA will then get uh, trucked to their final airport of destination. So basically, that's uh, for those of you that are not familiar, the air freight industry, they do operate, obviously, with aircraft. 
uh, but on your regional um, airports, uh, they do uh, utilize uh, trucking, trucking services. Uh, it's more cost efficient for the airlines to put a couple of pallets on a truck and send it down uh, to an Orlando or to a Charlotte or uh, Savannah, Georgia, than it is to run a dedicated flight from a, a, an airport hub, let's say like a New York, a Chicago or Atlanta, and then run a direct flight uh, to a smaller regional city uh, where they can actually put it on a truck. That has nothing to do with you, the customer. That's what we, the freight for to take care of. Those are the routing options that we consider. And we always uh, put your, your, your needs and your requirements first when we consider those routing options. Uh, for ocean freight, uh, the, the full containers will typically have a shorter transit time than the consolidated LCL service. Uh, the inner USA destinations are moved by rail. So something else to, for you to consider. If you're ever watching the news and you're taking, you're listening on how the rail unions and the railroad workers are going to strike in Long Beach or in Norfolk or, or in the East Coast, that's going to affect your shipping. That's going to affect all of our, our, our shipping time. So uh, th that's always big news. And just th for you to consider that ocean containers uh, arrive on your, your ocean ports. And then when they're moved inland into the, into the heart of the country, they're, they're moving by rail. Uh, 20 foot containers do need to be paired up when moved by rail. So something else to consider if you're going to be importing a 20 foot container. Uh, something to consider regarding the routing, uh, routing and transit time. LCL shipments are moved uh, in containers to the de deconsolidation points. Uh, picking up the container at the port ramp to deconsolidation can take an average of seven days. So that's why on our first line here, uh, ocean Full container load containers will typically have a shorter transit time than your consolidated containers. This is why the additional step of the consolidated container needing to go to a, a, a deconsolidating warehouse for handling, for additional handling. Uh, the other thing to consider uh, when you're shipping, especially if you're coming into the US, is your US customs clearance. It's good practice to get a, a customs broker uh, on hand uh, and to speak to a customs broker before your goods are shipped. Uh, you have to know your product. You have to know the capabilities and function of your product. What's your makeup and content of your product? Who's the manufacturer? Not who, who's the seller, but who's the manufacturer? Where, where did that product get made? The documentation that's required. Um, all products are gonna have a, uh, or, or have a, a, an identifiable uh, harmonized tariff uh, product number, product code. What this HTS number governs, it's gonna govern your duty rate. Uh, what government agency is involved? If any government quotas are involved with that product, uh, any anti-dumping regulations. Uh, and of course, for your product, if, if it's licensable, are there any licenses that need to be applicable to that product or are there any exceptions? So again, always good practice to speak to a customs broker um, when you're planning to importing goods into the U.S. And H&M Global, again, we are a freight forwarder and we also are a customs broker. Our next slide covers your customs clearance. Uh, other government agencies that be involved, you're going to have your U.S. Customs, right? That's one government entity. But depending on your product, you might have FDA involved. Uh, U.S. De Department of Agriculture, Agriculture might be involved. Your DOT might be involved. The EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Consumer Con uh, Safety Commissions. Uh, so, again, things for you to consider. Uh, don't try to do this on a fly. Speak to the pros. Speak to someone who's who's been doing it uh, for a number of years and can guide you, right? Things that you might need to know in advance so you could have all your, your, your ducks in a row prior to shipping. Uh, examples of documentation that, you, that you're uh, gonna need uh, for your shipping, whether it's import or export, you're gonna need your commercial invoice, your packing list, fum fumigation certificate, if it's required, uh, Lacey Act form, if you're, uh, if you're dealing with articles of wood, furniture, wood flooring, things of that nature. Anti-dumping statement. Again, applicable for anti-dumping, it depends on your product. Uh, interim footwear invoice, if you're dealing with footwear and task of certification, again, it depends on your product. Another thing to consider, you're dealing with your product, you've got, you've 
you've, you've, you've made a beautiful uh, product, you've sold it, you've marketed well, you're ready to ship, you're using a pallet, and it's a random pallet that you picked off the, the uh, off a warehouse floor. Important to know, all wood packing materials are governed by ISPM 15. Uh, they, it's a basically an international standard for phytosanitary measures, number 15. It's basically a, a protocol to, to stop the spread of invasive uh, quarantine pests that result in the usage of wood packing materials. So wood bracing materials, wood blocks, chalk blocks, pallets. Uh, the, the wood has to be fumigated. It has to be stamped with this marking uh, or, and or heat treated. So again, something for you to consider when, when you're dealing with a freight forwarder, we know to ask these questions. We know to have to use this type of wood packing material. So you're going to have your bases covered when you're dealing with a reputable company uh, with all these regulations that you need to consider. Um, something very important for you to uh, note and understand our country of origin marking requirements. Um, we're going to leave this in the slide. I'm not going to get uh, into it uh, specifically, but certain countries do require, have requirements for importing into, into the country. For example, imports into the USA, you need the country of origin marked on the article. So if you ever notice your shirt, when you go to put on your shirt or your pair of pants, it's going to say made in India, made in Bangladesh, made in China, made in uh, Costa Rica. That's a U.S. customs requirement. Each country has its own set of customs laws. So it's important whether you're importing into the U.S. or exporting out of the U.S., you speak with your with the customer. You ask questions regarding the the country of origin markings. Those requirements. Some quick tips uh, for you guys to know. I know there's been a lot of information, but again, this is why you have uh, people like uh, Lois, like Chris, like myself and Diego, people that you could turn to that you uh, that you should be able to trust when you have a question and we provide answers for you. So, quick tips on exporting. Know who your customer is. You need to know who they are. As an exporter, ultimately, you are responsible for your product and who you shipped it to. So know the end user. Know your product. Know your product is a license requirement is required. Is is, is the Department of 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 uh, of, of uh, Defense involved? Uh, export controls involved. Uh, the State Department involved. So you need to know your your product. Importing. Understanding, understand your duties and customs fees. Again, speak to a customs broker. You have your, your, your product costs, then you have your landed costs. Your landed costs are going to incorporate your duties and taxes and your transportation. So speak to a broker. Anti-dumping duties. Again, specific commodities, usually bulk commodities, but, but if that's what you're going to get into, you need to know what that, what that entails. And then... Um, Contact your customs broker before your product departs for ocean freight. There is an ISF requirement. Uh, U.S. Customs require a pre-notification for shipments coming into the U.S. That pre-notification usually needs to happen with, within 24 or 48 hours before departure from the foreign port, from the foreign country. You're not going to know that. Your broker will. Speak to a broker. For both, for exporting and for importing, Keep in mind your transit times, how you want it shipped. Do you want to pay a premium and, and, and get it your product uh, fast? Air freight. Do you want to save some money because you have lead time and we're in the first week of May, but it's okay if I get my product in mid-June? Ocean freight, okay? Uh, again, the shipper of record, your U.S. principal uh, party of interest, your importer of record, the responsibility is on you. When U.S. Customs or the government entity come knocking on the door, we as a freight forwarder are going to say, yes, we work with ABC Company and we follow their instructions. It's up to you, ABC Company, to realize that you're, you're responsible to U.S. Customs and you need to know, you need to have your ducks in a row, so you need to know your product and, you, and who your customers are. And last but not least, know your risks. So understand the INCO terms. Be familiar with them. Again, they're, they're, they're not laws, but they're a guideline for you so you could keep yourself out of trouble. And more importantly, keep your business running and, and focused on, on, on recurring sales. Helpful links for you guys as part of this uh, presentation is uh, Customs uh, and Border Protection, CBP. That's a good, link, uh, a good site to uh, log into. 
and also your Bureau of Industry and Security, your BIS. Um, helpful links. If you have a question, uh, they have chat options, uh, but a, a wealth and resource of information. So definitely check both sites out uh, when you uh, when you need to. And with that, Chris, I want to say thank you, and I appreciate it, and I uh, look forward to hearing from uh, Diego on, on his presentation as well. Thanks, JP. Uh, we have a few questions uh, for you that I'd like to read. Uh, the first sure. one comes from uh, Mark uh, Colangelo, uh, who asks, so what organization determines which certifications for importation into the US are needed to ship products, in his case, considering a rechargeable battery and electronics? Yeah, so that's a good question. And that's where um, um, the, the links at the bottom, if you go to CBP or BIS, uh, what you can do is you'll, you'll put in the product uh, that you're, you're working with and the, each site will tell you what you need to consider. So definitely uh, either one of those websites and or reaching out to your freight forwarder. But, but yes, dealing with batteries is very tricky. The lithium ion batteries, the regulations seem to change on a monthly basis. Uh, they can be shipped. It's specific on how they need to be shipped. But uh, if you speak to me, uh, we, we can cross that bridge when we get to it and we can offer some guidance. Thanks, GP. And I've got another question from Jen K who asks, where can she look for very specific information about how to package goods for exports? Uh, for instance, how thick of a cardboard she would need, how to stack the boxes on the pallet for maximum effectiveness, et cetera. Yeah, that, that, that is a good question. That information can also be found uh, on, on the links. It would probably probably be on the, uh, the BIS link uh, for your packing requirements, but if you reach out to to your freight forwarder, a uh, local freight forwarder, obviously I'm on the call, so uh, anyone on the call, any participant here can reach out to me. We can we can guide you in terms of of um, of what what packing materials you want. A good packing material company will tell you. You can tell them, hey, I'm I'm shipping uh, printers and uh, desk printers, but I want to make sure they get to where they need to go to. That packing material company should already know, be able to tell you, hey, you're gonna need some styrofoam uh, uh, packing, you're gonna need some peanuts, you're gonna need this grade level cardboard for international shipping, you could use this grade level cardboard for domestic shipping. So, uh, you know, you, you have resources there from the packing uh, companies to the, uh, the BIS website and or your freight forwarder. And also trust yourself, trust your common sense um, again, you, you, you made a viable product that someone wants to buy. You want to make sure they get it in, in good condition. How would you ship it? How would you want to receive your product and how would you want it? How would you want to see that packaging, right? We all have seen our, our Amazon boxes or uh, end up at our door. They're kind of beat up and you're like, Yeesh, I hope it's okay. You want to avoid that. So sometimes again, speak to the pros, but also kind of put yourself in your customer's shoes and, and, and if you have to spend a little bit extra on packing, maybe that's what you need to do to get some recurring sales going. I think that's a great learning point in terms of you always want to make sure that uh, the packaging uh, comes in good condition as well, because even though it may not have an impact on the uh, product, uh, uh, it uh, just uh, doesn't look good uh, when you get a, a crushed box. Uh, and. Uh, uh, you're exactly right with respect to that. And then your concern is, you know, what else does this mean for my product? Uh, I'm just going to add one uh, third question. And that is, uh, how do you, are you able to help uh, a company that not only has less than a container load, but might only be shipping um, a few cartons? Uh, so do, do they need to be shipping at least a pallet to work uh, with you? Or uh, is uh, just a, a carton or two enough? No, that's fine. We we, we work on, on with small pack and and, and smaller uh, size shipping. So so we we ship cartons. I, I shipped one okay. carton just last week. Uh, we we shipped it to Europe. It was an important uh, electronic component that needed to get to where it needed to go, and it was just one carton, eighteen kilos. You know, 30, 35 pounds, forty pounds. So the answer to that question is yes, and the participants get some insight on that uh, as well. 
when speaking with um, when speaking when they hear Diego's presentation because he deals with small pack as well. Um, and he's a little bit uh, more specialized in the e-commerce small pack department. But the, to the answer to your question, can a freight forwarder work with a single carton, small size shipments? The answer is yes. I appreciate that, JP. I think it's important for uh, small businesses to know that they don't have to be uh, doing a big shipment in order to use someone like H&M Global, or uh, I'll give a shout out to, to my uh, friend, Mary Robbins uh, uh, with JF Moran, who's uh, also uh, on today. Uh, uh, Mary is uh, one of my great uh, colleagues uh, over at the Central North Florida District Export Council. Um, and I got one more question here, and that is whether Indian packaging meets uh, US requirements. Um, I'm going to have to do a street shout out on that one for more information. Uh, that's okay. kind of a very general question. Uh, we've shipped from India. Sure. I've shipped from India uh, via air freight, uh, ocean freight. Uh, we've never, I haven't had a problem with U.S. Customs stopping uh, shipments from India due to packaging reasons. So I'm going to reply, do a, have a general reply by saying that the Indian manufacturers are aware of shipping requirements and, and what they need to do. Uh, but again, that would be a, a more sp specific question to ask the shipper or the supplier in India when you're trying to place that order and trying to bring it into the US. Hey, Mr. Supplier, uh, I spoke to my freight forwarder. It's gonna be over 30 days on the water for this shipment. Are you packing it correctly? Uh, are these cartons gonna hold up? Uh, a lot of the pallets that are you building, are they going to hold up over 30 days being in a container on the water? Uh, hey, Mr. Shipper, we're going to, I spoke to my freight forwarder, we're going to uh, import this via air freight. Uh, it's got a connecting flight in London or in Frankfurt or wherever. Is, is that carton, is that packaging going to make it uh, over four days transit time in, in, uh, for air freight routing and, and a connecting flight? So those are good questions to ask your shipper or your supplier. Um, and again, always circle back to, to, to your friendly neighborhood freight forwarder uh, or, your, or, or your Chris Leggett uh, at the Entrepreneurial Center and, and see who, what he might have to say. But again, it, uh, most countries, so China, India, mo most of our trading partners, they want to trade with the U.S. They want the, the U.S. market. They want to work with the participants. So they 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 put it upon themselves to understand what some of these requirements are. So they're very easy to work with for the U.S. market because they do have an, a level of understanding of what they need to do to be successful for the U.S. market. Uh, but again, ask the question and 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 be specific with your questions and and know your shipper, know your supplier. If, it, if you can do a Zoom call, great. You speak to them face-to-face. -to -face. If you can actually go and visit with them, even better. Because, again, we're people and, and personal, personal relationships is what makes a business go around. And if you, can, if, if, it's a, if you can make it to the point where you can visit with your supplier and your shipper and see what it is that you're going to be importing and, and, and how it's packaged, then you have that peace of mind that that – that you saw with your own eyes, the, your product and how it's gonna be shipped to you. Thanks, JP. I think there I'm gonna cut off the quest Q and A for now. Uh, JP, please uh, feel free to go ahead and answer uh, some of the questions directly in there, or uh, maybe people can reach out to you and have a, a conversation about uh, uh, some of these uh, specific questions uh, uh, that they have. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to pass things uh, over to Diego, who's going to be talking about uh, uh, more of the distribution fulfillment uh, side of things and how to get to your products to your consumer. So thanks, Diego. Hey, thanks so much, Chris. Thanks so much for, for having me. Uh, JP, I was, it was some amazing class and with amazing questions. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that, that, that knowledge. Thank you, Diego. So let me share my screen here with you guys. So well, thank you very much for, for the opportunity once again. My name is Diego Sampaio. I'm originally from Brazil, but I've been living here in Orlando for uh, 10, 10 years. And as the founder at, at GlobalFi, our main goal is to help companies 
from um, the US and all over the world to uh, distribute their products into the, the US market. So usually uh, we have here some of our customers. We're gonna work with them on the uh, final part of the logistics. So JP, for example, will move their products from China, uh, India, Latin America, Europe to the West, and we're gonna work and help them in the process of taking the product, that product from uh, uh, their warehouse, fulfillment center, and deliver that to their customers, or even deliver that to an Amazon fulfillment center, for example, where Amazon will take care of the last mile of the, the, the delivery. But I mean, our goal here is, and my goal at the presentation is to explain you a little bit more how a logistics company works in terms of that final part and domestic shipping and tell you how you can do that by yourself. If you're starting, for example, you don't have to start hiring someone to make your first 100 shipments. 200 shipments. You can do that by yourself. But my goal here is to explain how a full logistics company, a fulfillment company works. And that way you can better understand how you can benefit for that or how you can set up your own operation to, to start and ramp your, your, your business. So, I mean, we've been in business for seven, for eight years. Uh, we have almost 40,000 uh, 40, uh, square foot here in Orlando for fulfillment center. We have over 60 team members in the whole company. And I mean, the, the whole platform and the whole operation was developed, as, I, as I, I mentioned, to help small companies to get uh, uh, high quality uh, fulfillment and logistics operation without having to do large investments by their, their own. So I'll share here a, a really quick video about the structure, at least so you can better understand uh, how we operate and then Diego, I don't know if you want to do some narrating because we don't hear the sound. Okay. No, no, no problem, Chris. No problem regarding the sound. So, I mean, that, that's, that's our operation in, in uh, I can tell you guys, uh, when you talk about logistics, there's two uh, huge friends that you have to, to, to have. The first one is a good customer broker. I mean, someone that understands your product and help you to move your product from abroad to the US. The second one, it's not a good fulfillment company, but it's a good WMS, a good warehouse management system or a good way to control your goods. So those are the key two things that you guys have to have in mind once you're gonna do your logistics uh, uh, operation. Oops. There you are. Let me go back to print, sorry. Yes, they are. So how, how the whole distribution model uh, would work? The first thing is that uh, they would have a really big uh, um, dependency on business to business. So with the D2C and with internet, that, that uh, a need to have someone to represent and resell your products has been uh, decreasing. So now you can do that by your own. You don't have to have high fixed costs anymore, work with a lot of bureaucracy and having to always have high volumes of shipments. As JP was mentioned, you can ship as, as much as one small box to multiple containers. And there's always way, a ways that you can find to move your product from one place to another one. Something else is that there's no more need for you to have multiple providers. So when you hire someone as on Global 5 for the fulfillment, you're dealing with only, only us and we're taking care of the contracts with FedEx, UPS, USPS, uh, buying your package and materials and so on. When you hire someone as H&M, uh, uh, they're gonna take care of not just the customer's broker, but the transportation, the duties and so on. So, I mean, you can have like one, two good partners and then they're gonna take care of our operation for, for you. And uh, as, uh, as some of you are aware, I mean, a lot of new brands are coming up with the D2C model, that's the direct to consumer. This means that they control the whole uh, uh, operation. 
So usually they are the manufacturer or they create a product and hire a manufacturer for, for them to, to manufacture that for them, but they control the, the, the product, they control the sales channels. So they're gonna sell on Amazon, they're gonna sell on their own Shopify or Walmart, and they're gonna have direct touch, they're gonna be directly in touch with the consumer. So this brings more power for the brands and this brings uh, more revenue and more profits for the, the, the brand's owners. So that's, I mean, that's what Amazon mostly does uh, with their Amazon marketplace where I can, let's say, create here a new product and in two days be selling that on Amazon or a, a brand from Latin America can uh, introduce their products in multiple marketplaces or a brand from America, from the US can sell their products in uh, Europe or in um, Western Europe, um, I'm sorry, in Asia, without having to set up an entity over there using Amazon as their marketplace. So did you see something that has been changing the industry and giving way more power for brands and for small entrepreneurs? Because now you don't depend anymore on Walmart buying your product and then reselling it or finding a big distributor for you that can deliver locally in the whole US. That's not necessary anymore. You can do that from really from, from, from your, your house anywhere in the world, just use internet and some good uh, uh, um, service providers. Talk a little bit about uh, the, sea, the shipping cycle when someone's starting a new brand. Usually they're gonna start shipping their, their orders from their home. So again, you bought a pallet of products from China and, or you, you, you deliver that at your home, at your office. I mean, that doesn't require a lot of space and you can do that specific from, from, from your home or from your, your office. You don't have to set up a full warehouse with high technology and hundreds of thousands of dollars in investments to start shipping your products. Uh, later on, when you already have some volume, let's say 300, 500, $1,000 a month, uh, 1,000 orders a month, you're gonna be looking for a third party fulfillment uh, uh, facility. Someone that already made the investments and they have, they have the operation and then they can you can quickly scale your business while you take care of the sales and customer service and someone is taking care of the shipment. And later on, when you are big enough, you may consider moving to your own fulfillment operation, make the investments or keep working with a third party as long as they are delivering this, the level of service that your product and your customers uh, requires. Key points, uh, key investment points when you're looking um, to start shipping your products, okay? So the first thing is that you have to pay attention and make sure that you're shipping fast to be able to deliver it fast. That's top priority. So you have to have some options for same day shipping, not same day delivery, but same day shipping. So in our case, if we got an order until 3 p.m. Eastern time, that order will be shipped at same day. So this means that if your consumer put a, purchase something at 12 p.m. In, in, or in New York, they're gonna receive the tracking number for that, for that shipping at the same day. And the product will start moving from Orlando to New York at the same day. So let's give another one to two, to two business days to be delivered in New York. They're gonna have a, a quick delivery, a good experience getting their products into business days. The second one is regarding accuracy. Again, as I mentioned before, it's really important to have good tools to have control of your inventory, uh, uh, depending in, on your product on expiration dates and the volume that you have inside your, uh, the, the volume of products that you have in, in your inventory and what is your average sales by month to be able to put on, to buy new products and to move them from abroad or from the US to your facility, to do not break and to do not stop shipping your products on time. Uh, consumers nowadays are really, uh, um, nothing. I mean, all of us, we go to Amazon, we purchase something today, we expect to get by tomorrow or in two business days, right? So we want something fast and having the products in your inventory, having a good software to manage your orders and to manage your shipments and processing those orders faster, fast, uh, is really, really important. Then you're going to have to pay attention and to negotiate good shipping rates. And there are tools 
like a uh, ship station that will provide you uh, with good rates for FedEx, UPS, and USPS. They're going to charge you like $15 a month, $20 a month to give you access to those rates and to use a platform. And that's actually a, a really good start when you're shipping from your home or from your, your, your office. And then again, uh, having a currency, having a clear vision of your products or shipments, you have to provide a really good customer service regarding returns and delivery times and tracking numbers and so on. How, uh, uh, how we make that simple and what do you have to have in mind when you're set up in your fulfillment operation? So first thing is to find a tool, as I mentioned, ShipStation. We run, uh, or we have our own platform for that, but that will connect your uh, different stores to a, a, a central inventory. So if you're selling on uh, Amazon and you're selling on Shopify and you're selling Walmart and you have your own and you have only one inventory, you have to have all those sales channels connected to that, to that centerpiece. That's the WMS. That's what will manage your shipping and inventory operation. So you have to have that and to connect your stores. Then you're going to uh, ship your products to our fulfillment center, or let's say you're going to receive your products from abroad. You're going to do the inventory. So we're go you're going to check if the quantity that you receive, the quality of your products, and you're gonna put on your inventory, that WMS will update uh, all your sales channels. And therefore you're gonna have one central inventory to all your, your uh, sales channels. Then of course you have to sell and then to pick, pack, ship and track. So, I mean, the process is actually pretty, pretty simple. There's not too much involved here. Something else that's really, really important uh, is that you have to consider having a plan A. What is plan A? If you're gonna sell in the US direct for the consumer, I mean, almost 50% of the e-commerce is owned by Amazon. So you will probably sell your product on Amazon. Amazon has a service that's called Fulfillment by Amazon or FBA that allows you to ship your product from anywhere in the world or from domestically or internationally to their fulfillment centers and they're gonna take care of the delivery of those orders. This is really good because Amazon has like almost a hundred different, has over a hundred fulfillment centers in the US. And if you have a high volume and, uh, um, and uh, good selling product, they're gonna get your inventory in one location and they're gonna split that inventory into multiple locations. Meaning that they will deliver your order and a lot of times same day delivery or next day or two days delivery for free for the final user and with a really, really good uh, shipping rate for, for yourself. So, I mean, uh, consider, if, you consider, if you are considering sell on Amazon, you should consider using their fulfillment service for the orders that you're going to receive from, from, from them. Usually for small and medium uh, items, their shipping rates are superb. I mean, you're not going to find anything cheaper anywhere uh, outside Amazon. But for larger larger items, sometimes it's important to, to, to consider other options like a con directly contract with FedEx or UPS, or as I mentioned before, using a fulfillment center that already has, uh, already has those good, good, good rates. Something else that uh, about Amazon, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding is regarding how you're going to ship your products to them. So you can ship your products to Amazon on small carton. So let's say you have a small product, you can put on like 40 units inside the box and ship to their fulfillment, uh, uh, one of their fulfillment facilities. But if you have a high volume uh, uh, product or if you have a large inventory, you can use like LTL uh, to transport the, those pallets from your facility directly for Amazon. So Amazon provides both options for you to ship your products over there. And they're gonna usually have a maximum volume uh, storage of storage of the early days from your operation until they figure out how much, how many products you're moving every month. And then they're gonna start increasing that storage space that you have with them. But again, if you're considering selling Amazon, you should learn more about FBA and how that can benefit your, your business. Uh, when we sell online, it's really important to understand what are the costs for those transactions and how that will impact your, your business. So I brought here like three main aspects of selling online, three different ways. 
So the first one's like on the marketplace, like Walmart, eBay, or Amazon, where uh, um, the process is done on an auto service. So you can sign up on Amazon, eBay, Walmart. You can uh, list your products. You're gonna put the pictures, the copy, the descriptions, the dimensions, and so on. And every time uh, you, they sell one of those units, you're gonna pay them in the average 15 to 18 percent uh, as a transaction fee. And in all those cases, you can uh, uh, invest money to do ads inside their platform. So you're gonna pay the transaction fee plus ads. And if you're using fulfillment by Amazon, for example, on Amazon, you're gonna pay them for the fulfillment service. The second model is gonna be like Wayfair or some niche marketplace. Those are marketplace that although you can sign up, they have to approve your product. So they will make sure that, for example, on Wayfair, they're gonna make sure that the product that you're looking to sell fits their uh, catalog, that you have the correct insurance for the product and insurance for, for your company, that you listed that, them as beneficiary in the insurance. So I mean, those uh, marketplace, they will, they will go deeper in the process of validating your product and your company to allow you to, to sell there. Uh, on the other hand, they're gonna uh, have lower transaction fees. So for example, on Wayfair, you don't, they don't charge your transaction fee. Why, what they do is you tell, you tell them how much gonna be your B2B uh, uh, price. They're gonna um, mark up that. They're gonna sell for as much as they believe that product's worth. And then they're gonna pay you exactly what you charge from, the, from, from them. But again, they're not buyer merchandise. They're gonna pay only once uh, you have uh, sales. And then the third option is gonna be on your own uh, uh, sales channel. So Shopify is the largest and probably uh, the best and more uh, most affordable tool for the US. You're gonna pay usually only the credit card fees for those, those transactions. And then I brought here an example of a light item. So in this case, let's say a swimwear. So if you have, for example, using or, or fulfillment operation, if you have a hundred SKUs, I mean, a hundred different models of your product, they're gonna be probably a small volume. You're gonna pay around $150 for storage for all those, uh, um, in this case, 5,000 uh, uh, units of those hundred uh, SKUs. And then, the cost they're gonna have is gonna be based on the volume that you ship. So here we have an example that uh, uh, you, you do 420 orders a month. Uh, each order has an average of two items. So this means that the pick and pack cost for us is gonna be $3. So we're gonna charge you $3 to, to pick up the product, to pack that. We're gonna charge 20 cents for like the regular en envelope. And you're gonna pay another $3.50 for USPS. And the, the good things that the costs are, are variable. You don't have to have uh, employees taking care of the operation. You're gonna only pay based on the storage volume and on the shipping uh, uh, volume that, that you have. Um, um, and then, I mean, the, 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 to, to, to wrap it up here, I mean, the whole point when you're selling into the US, again, is to figure out what is the best operation for your actual stage. So you don't have to start big. You don't have to start importing a full container. You don't have to start with your 24,000 square foot facility. You, you can definitely start that from your office or from your home, as long as you find the right partners that can allow you to scale and, uh, and uh, allowing you to focus on selling and providing a good customer service while someone is taking care of importing your product, shipping your product and handle all those minor uh, or those secondary tasks that uh, we as entrepreneurs, we, although we like to do, we have to, to be focused on what brings us uh, revenue, right? Not on the day-by-day -day operation. Well. Here we have my contacts. I'm more than happy to help you regarding anything uh, uh, domestic shipping on that last mile fulfillment. It's, I'm always happy to be here with Chris and with JP and uh, um, with other entrepreneurs from, from Central Florida, helping them grow and scaling their, their online business. Thank, thank you so much, guys.
Thanks so much, Diego. Uh, I've got a question here from Ana D'Abruzzo. Uh, what is your advice regarding merchandise redirection uh, retail, for retail resellers to Brazil? Uh, Brazilian regulations and the best place to send USPS, UPS, FedEx, any others? Nice. So this means uh, shipping from the US to Brazil, right? Retail to I Brazil. So. Yes. Nice. So yeah, uh, look, every time you're going to ship to a different country, you have to be careful regarding the US regulations and the destination regulations. So if you're going to ship to Europe, you're going to have the VAT. So each country that has a different VAT, so you have to make sure that you are uh, uh, shipping your products, who's going to pay for the taxes, and so on. When you ship specifically to Brazil, to Brazil, there's the import uh, duties, right? They're going to charge taxes when the product gets to, 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 to Brazil. Uh, shipping to the whole Latin America, the, not just Brazil, it's pretty tricky. If you use uh, USPS, that is usually the most affordable option for smaller items, because all the domestic part inside the US is done by USPS, but, but once that gets to the airplane, to the destination, then it's gonna be on the local uh, uh, post, uh, post, postal service. So in Brazil, that's gonna be Correios, for example. So then your customer, you have to track part of the, the I mean, they, they, they're gonna be able to track the shipment on Correios website or USPS website, but the information will never be 100% accurate, unfortunately. So when you're shipping international with USPS, there's gonna be always, it's gonna be always tricky because once it gets to the destination, it's gonna be the local uh, um, uh, customs that will work around with Correios, in this case for Brazil, to collect the duties. And then there's a longer process in time, let's say a shipment from the US to Brazil may take 30 days to be delivered. Uh, if you ship internationally with UPS, FedEx or DHL, then you have um, a higher quality service, but of course the cost is higher too. On the other hand, once, once you ship with those, uh, um, with those larger couriers, they're gonna take care of the customs in the, at the destination. And then you can decide to ship if delivery uh, duty pays as DDP. This means that once it gets there, and let's say there's $100 as tax to on duties to import, they're going to charge from you, not from the destination. So that gives you a better, uh, um, a better and clear view for the final cost to the consumer. And there's there are tools that allow, allow you to display that inside your shopping inside your Shopify, for example, and the customers pay you everything in advance, and then you deliver them in three, four, five business days in their home country without they have to worry about any anything. I'm actually in Brazil right now. I'm in an event here in Rio de Janeiro, and I was talking to a company yesterday that does that process for brands in the US. So they have the whole contracts for the international shipment. They have the legal entity in Brazil to be able to collect the payments from the, the consumers in Latin America, Brazil, the whole Latin America. And uh, they're gonna tell you exactly how much that shipping costs and the duties will be for your final consumer. So that way you don't have to take care of anything. They're gonna tell you exactly what's gonna be the cost. Consumers pay you and then you take care to pay them and they're going to deliver your goods in three to five business days. So, I mean, there's already solutions for that that doesn't require you to do huge investments, and then you help you to scale not only domestically, but internationally too. Thank you, Diego. And we have uh, one final question from uh, Mark Colangelo, uh, which is at, who's asking about Fulfilled by Amazon. Uh, that is only available for Amazon sellers or to anyone wishing to use their final mile delivery? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole concept of FBA is to allow Amazon to deliver the orders that they sell faster. Uh, having said that, they allow you uh, to connect your Shopify store to the fulfillment by Amazon process and use their delivery network to sell uh, on your Shopify. You can use that to sell on walmart.com, for example. It has to be on your own store. But of course, the delivery uh, time is not as good as when you buy directly on, on Amazon. Because again, they don't want to compete with, with themselves. And as their fulfillment centers are really uh, uh, packed, and uh, they have been, in, in my opinion, they, they are fading out that option to allow someone to sell on Shopify and to use their delivery network 
as they need space to grow with the sales that they already have inside Amazon. But yeah, Mark, I mean, you can use the products that are FBA on uh, fulfillment by Amazon to sell on Amazon at the same time that you're selling on Shopify, and then they're going to take care of the final final mile delivery. Not as fast as um, when a customer purchases from Amazon, but they can do that for you. Excellent. Well, thank you, Diego, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm sure that you've all been impressed, as I have, by these two great presentations by Diego and JP about moving your products around the country and around the world and how Amazon is a great but not the only option when you're looking for a high quality fulfillment service. Uh, and most importantly, while shipping your products uh, can be complex, there are great service providers like H&M Global, like Global Fi to help you with this. Uh, I have two exciting upcoming events to share with you, though I see- uh, Hey, hey, Lois hey is Chris. Uh -huh. Hey, Chris, can I just say one thing? Sure. Uh, yeah, to the participants, I, I'd like you guys to know that you could actually use both our companies. You know, you could you could have an H&M Global as your freight forwarder and a Globify as your as your distribution arm or, or, or your fulfillment arm. So, again, we, we, we can cooperate with each other. We, we want to work in your best interest, right, because we want to keep our customers happy uh, so that you can make money so that we can make money together. Uh, so so it, it, we, we can cooperate together and just keep in mind that you could use both our companies together at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, there's, there's a whole spectrum of people who are out there ready uh, and wanting to help small businesses as they get started to, to help them with marketing their product, help them with manufacturing the product, and in this case, to help them either get components uh, to the United States or... Uh, products that they're going to distribute here in the United States into the country and then uh, vice versa going uh, uh, around the world. What a great webinar. You know, I love hosting these because I learn so much, even if I've said in them before, it's, it's always so enlightening. One of the things at SCORE is we want to make sure you, we're providing entrepreneurs with what they need. So if you would just take a, a camera shot of this QR code and give us comments on Google Review. Entrepreneurs like to hear from other entrepreneurs. So when you say great webinar, I learned a lot, it means much more than if I go out and say that. So help your, your fellow entrepreneurs, and particularly if there's a topic you are interested in that you're not seeing a webinar from us, Give us a note on that because we're always looking for new topics. As I said, we'll do about 280 a year, but there's no reason we can't do 290 if you help us with some more topics. So with that, I'm going to wish everyone a great day, a happy Thursday as we roll into the weekend and hope you have a great one. I hope you're blessed with beautiful weather like we are in Central Florida right now. But any last questions before we uh, close out today? All righty. Okay, guys. Well, thank you all so much and have a thank great Thank you, everyone.